Welcome to Landmark Chambers webinar on the Nationality and Borders Act Part 1. We are delighted to see so many of you joining the session today. And obviously, we hope that you will find the presentations and discussions to be both useful and informative. My name, as you can see from the screen, is Richard Drabble, QC. And I will uh, chair the session today, joined by my colleagues Natasha Jackson and Charles Bishop whom I will formally introduce in a moment. Tim Bewley QC was originally due to chair this webinar, however, due to unforeseen circumstances, he's unavailable today to be in court, uh, arguing about no recourse to public funds. Sorry, no, got them wrong. Alex, no, Tim Bewley is uh, unavoidably detained. Alex Goodman, who is the person who is in court talking about no recourse to public funds, was due to be present at today's webinar, uh, but because of that urgent hearing, he's had to pre-record his talk, and this will be shown during today's webinar. To begin with, there are a few housekeeping points to note. Firstly, your microphones are automatically muted, so you will not need to adjust your local settings. We very much welcome questions throughout the session. Please submit them via text in the Q&A section, which will be found at either the top or bottom of your screen. Please note that if you want to remain anonymous when asking a question, please make sure you tick the Send Anonymously box before submitting your question. We will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation, but it's worth bearing in mind that Alex Goodman isn't here, uh, so uh, uh, we may not be able to answer in quite the same way the questions before addressing the subject matter. The webinar will be recorded. You will receive a link to the presentation and the recording shortly after the event concludes. If your connection is lost at any point during the webinar. We invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once again. But can I just say something about this series of seminars um, and the and the Act itself. The Nationality and Borders Act 2022 makes what are quite clearly sweeping changes to the United Kingdom immigration and nationality system. Some of the key, key provisions uh, I shall summarize in just a moment. This seminar um, is uh, addressed to an asylum. Uh, there will be uh, a second seminar on the 24th of May addressed to nationality, age assessments, and traffic and trafficking. So today's seminar will cover offshoring, priority, and short notice removals that will be covered by Alex Goodman in his recorded talk, changes to the standard of proof, membership of a particular social group, and the treatment of state protection covered by Charles Bishop, and the criminalization provision covered by Natasha Jackson. And as I just said, there will be a further seminar on the 24th of May, which will cover nationality provisions, age assessments, and trafficking. I don't want to talk a lot in a lot of detail about what we're covering today, or they'll be covered by the speakers. But the principal changes to the asylum system are introducing a two-tier asylum system, meaning that those who arrive in the United Kingdom via irregular means may receive less protection and support. Creating new inadmissibility and offshoring provisions, introducing penalties for late submission of evidence, so that this is either taken to damage the claimant's credibility or to affect the weight given to the evidence. Removing stages of appeal or fast-tracking certain cases, Increasing a new accelerated detained appeals process and increasing the standard of proof for establishing whether someone is a refugee, reducing the threshold at which someone is considered to have committed a particularly serious crime and therefore may not receive refugee protection, and criminalizing those who arrive in the UK without permission. So that's the agenda for today. It covers really quite a lot of ground. I think one of the things that we may all want to bear in mind in the background is how long 
it's going to take for the uh, appellate and judicial and court system to get a handle on how big a change all these various changes are. And we'll want to discuss that a little bit in the question and answer session. Also worth bearing in two, two, mind, two things which are not covered by any of the speakers today. Uh, first of all, commencement provisions. Large parts of the Act are not yet in force, but only in force for the purposes of making regulations. No clear date for, for, for which much of the Act comes into force, so you need to be alert uh, to sudden changes. We want to get an easy and rapid handle on the scheme of the commencement provisions, look at section 87 of the Act. Some of the relevant provisions for the purposes of this talk will come into force on the 28th of June, namely section 30 regarding the interpretation of the FCT Convention, sections 31 to 36 and 38 on the interpretation of the Refugee Convention, uh, and schedule 4 and section 29 regarding the removal of asylum seekers to a third country, and section 28, removing the right of appeal for certain claims certified as clearly unfounded. And section 27, accelerated detained appeals came into force on the 28th of April 2022 for the purposes of making and consulting on the necessary regulations. So that's a very brief outline of what we're going to cover today. Um, can I just say a word now about our three speakers so that the formal introductions have been done at the beginning. Um, first of all, Alex Goodman. Um, he's a Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year, so he's got some claim to fame. He recently led Charles Bishop, one of our other speakers, in arguing a case in the High Court before Mrs Justice Lever uh, about the Special Development Order Granting Commission for the Nature of Barrett Asylum Accommodation Centre which was held to be unlawful, and he's due to lead Miranda Butler in a challenge to the denial of access to legal advice for being detained at the new detention centre in County Durham. And as I've already said, and as you've seen by absence from us today, he's run a recent line of cases on no legal public funds conditions, um, uh, uh, which indeed led to his nomination as Legal Aid Lawyer of the Year. Turning to Natasha, Natasha Jackson, uh, she was called to the bar in 2015 and moved to Landmark earlier this year, specialised in public law and public inquiries, and was instructed as lead junior counsel to the Iraq Fatalities Investigation, recently been acting in high court litigation uh, concerning the various Afghan relocation assistance schemes. Uh, she's a member of the Attorney General C panel, uh, offers legal advice on family reunification and asylum in Greece with RLS Athens and teaches public law at the LSE. Charles Bishop has a short life as a barrister, but long and impressive experience in connection with this field. Um, he was called, called to qualify as a barrister in October 21. Uh, he was the legal and parliamentary officer before that at the Immigration Law Practitioners Association where he led on work relating to Brexit. Before that, he was a parallel to a well-known paralegal to a well-known immigration solicitor and is currently a trustee at Rainbow Migration. So with that short introduction, can I hand over to uh, Alex Goodman virtually in more than the usual sense uh, for his short Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for standing in as chair. I'm sorry, everyone, I can't be here live. I'm in court uh, today, so I've pre-recorded my section. I'm going to be talking about parts two of the uh, Nationality and Borders Act 2022, and I have um, not prepared slides. I suggest simply um, if you log on to the Act on the legislation.gov website, because I'm just going to be talking about the provisions there. Um, the changes which are brought in by the parts of the Act with which I'm concerned today are dramatic. Uh, they principally signal uh, a partial decoupling of domestic practice, process and criteria around the recognition of refugees from the standards 
established uh, internationally around the Refugee Convention, such that the UK will, to some extent now, be operating its own bespoke system with a number of unusual features around appeal rights and deemed damage to credibility and requirements for refugees to come by a specific route to the UK or to claim in the first safe country or to claim at a designated space, which all of which are not features of the Refugee Convention itself. There's no time, unfortunately, to go into the huge amounts of nuance which this act creates today, but uh, I'm sure much will be written about it in coming weeks and months. I propose to set out the headlines so that they uh, as hopefully will stick in all of our minds as, as issues come up in cases we're dealing with. So starting then with the beginning of part two to the, uh, to the act, section 12. Section 12 creates group one and group two refugees. Group one is refugees who have come directly from the country from which they're fleeing and who have presented themselves without delay to the authorities and who have good cause for any unlawful entry or presence in the UK. A stopover in a country in which a refugee could not reasonably have claimed asylum doesn't count for the purposes of coming directly to the UK. That's section 37.1. Without delay means as soon as reasonably practicable. Uh, in the case of surplus refugees, uh, they have a claim to asylum while they have leave to be in the UK for some other reason. So they have to claim asylum while they are, uh, while they have leave in the UK, or as soon as reasonably practical after they become aware of their need for protection. So that that's, um, covers group one. Subsections five and six then provide that group one and group two refugees and their families may be treated differently in terms of the length of leave to remain given, the requirements they must meet to obtain indefinite leave to remain, whether a condition of no recourse to public funds is imposed on their leave, and whether leave to enter or remain is given to members of the refugee's family. So in short, for those uh, asylum seekers who are perceived to arrive in the UK uh, by an irregular route, um, they will be subject to more restrictive conditions in terms of their um, leave that's given, conditions imposed on that leave, and the way in which provisions around their families' rights may extend. Um, and so as I flagged at the beginning, this isn't something that reflects the Refugee Convention, which doesn't have a provision that says a person must come directly from uh, the country they're fleeing, but um, it's, it, it does establish a new approach in the UK specifically. Um, section 13, moving on, is about accommodation of asylum seekers. Now, Section 13 is also about creating differentiations between groups. Uh, here, between uh, different kinds of destitute asylum seekers uh, and their entitlements to Section 4 or Section 95 accommodation and support. Uh, and this will depend on whether uh, a declaration of inadmissibility is being considered. Now this is a, a new, again, a new idea that uh, is, is covered under a new sections uh, 80A, 80B and 80C, the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002. Uh, and I'm gonna come on to that because it's dealt with under uh, sections 15 and 16 of the Act. Section um, 17 of the Act also makes amendments to section four of the 1999 Act to accommodate this new concept of in inadmissible asylum claims. So this section also appears to be aimed at legitimizing the system of accommodation centers, which is emerging. And the first examples of that, in fact, preceded the act. Um, we've seen one was set up at Penali under emergency powers. Uh, there's, that's now closed. There's the Napier Barracks in Folkestone, which has been converted to asylum accommodation and which was granted planning permission under a, a very rarely used special development order, essentially by dint of a, a statutory instrument laid under a negative resolution procedure in Parliament, which is now subject to a challenge by judicial review. And judgments are waited on that um, from Mrs Justice Leven. Uh, there's a new asylum accommodation centre proposed to be opening in Linton on Ouse in Yorkshire for up to 1,500 asylum seekers. There was one uh, which was aborted because of planning reasons in um, 
uh, Yarl's Wood, next door to Yarl's Wood. And there's also been an attempt, which again was aborted, to open one in a place called Barton Stacey in the West Country. So that's section 13. Moving to section 14, this imposes a statutory requirement that asylum seekers uh, can only claim asylum in a designated place. I won't say more about that because I understand Charles Bishop's going to be dealing with that in his talk. Sections 15 and 16, these insert the new sections 80A, 80B and 80C into the 2002 Act and create that new idea of inadmissible asylum claims, which I referred to just now, against which there is no appeal. Uh, these provide that any claim by an EU national is inadmissible, save in exceptional circumstances, uh, and those are defined as meaning where uh, formal derogations from the European Convention on Human Rights have been made, uh, or a country is the subject of proceedings before the Council of Europe concerning a breach of uh, the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. Section 16 allows the Secretary of State to declare an application inadmissible, an application for asylum inadmissible, if the person has a connection to a safe third country, which means a country in which an application has a connection or has made an asylum claim, or in which it would have been reasonable for them to have made an asylum claim, but they failed to do so. So section 16 is wide reaching because it means that claims from anybody passing through Europe on their way can be deemed inadmissible uh, and there's no appeal from the inadmissibility decision. Um, so these provisions 15 and 16 must replace the Dublin Convention with a far more sweeping power. Experience also shows that the so-called safe countries have in numerous instances not been safe and much litigation has ensued previously under the Dublin Convention, for example, about removals to Greece or Italy. Uh, and one can anticipate similar kinds of judicial reviews proceeding pursuant to these provisions. Section 18 provides power to serve something called an evidence notice on a person who has made a protection claim or human rights claim requiring, uh, and that requires evidence to be provided before a certain date. Section 19 then amends Section 8 of the Asylum and Immigration Treatment of Claimants, etc. Act 2004, so as to create more circumstances in which the tribunal or SIAC, though not the Secretary of State, must regard relevant behaviour as damaging their credibility. One of those circumstances is a failure to provide evidence by the date of the Section 18 notice, the evidence notice. So, for example, in an asylum claim, a person may appear before the tribunal and they may explain they were a Christian from, from Iran, for the sake of argument. Now, the tribunal may, on the face of the evidence given, believe that case, but where these provisions apply, it must then find, on the basis of the procedural non-compliance, the failure to comply with a deadline, that that damages their view of whether the uh, claimant was telling the truth. So that's a very unusual mix of enforcing procedural rigour by imposing a substantive disadvantage, uh, which is seemingly not closely connected to the procedural um, default. And again, this will no doubt have to be litigated a fair amount to make sense of it, as was the case when Section 8, 8 was first introduced. Um, Section 20 provides for a system of priority removal notices, which is an extension of the one-stop notice system and requires a statement of grounds for resisting removal or deportation and any evidence to be given by a certain date. Where a person is served with a priority removal notice, they may be subject to a new expedited appeal to the upper tribunal, which is under a new section 82A of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002, for which provision is made by section 23, and Schedule 3 to the Act. Where the person served with a priority removal notice then responds late to a priority removal notice, again, that procedural failure must be taken into account here, not just by the tribunal, as was the previous section, but by both the Secretary of State and the tribunal as damaging that person's credibility. So again, there seems to be something of a disconnect here between a person's credibility, let's say, for example, they say, I was a homosexual from Iran uh, and I'm persecuted for that reason, and their ability to comply with procedural rules speedily in the UK. So again, it seems to me to be a disconnect which is going to have to be sorted out um, by some litigation. Um, there's also a further twist here, which is not only that 
the service of late evidence must be regarded as damaging credibility. But then by section 26, unless there are good reasons for its lateness, the deciding authority must, in considering it, have regard to the principle that minimal weight should be given to the evidence. Um, section 25 amends the Legal Aid Sentencing and Punishing, Punishment of Offenders Act 2012 so as to prescribe that a person in receipt of a PRN may receive no more than seven hours legal services in relation to their immigration status uh, and in relation to the PRN and the lawfulness of their removal from the UK. Section 27 introduces a new version of the detained fast track. It's quite a big new thing. The new process is called an accelerated detained appeal. It applies to people who are detained and who are to appeal against a decision of a kind to be designated by the Secretary of State, who has power to certify a case for the accelerated appeal process, if she considers it to be of a kind that would be likely to be determined expeditiously. Uh, the section provides for appeals to be made within five days and determined within 25 working days and any onward appeal within 20 working days. Now the operational problems with the detained fast track are well known and were subject to many challenges both on individual cases and, and sort of system-wide challenges by in particular the Refugee Legal Centre and Detention Action. Uh, the, the first detention action case in 2015 is probably the most relevant to this. Uh, and and in, after that case, the, the, detention, the detained fast track was said by the Court of Appeal to be structurally unfair and unjust. Um, the compromise of legal process was the point of particular note. Now, Section 27.5 of the Act provides for tribunal procedurals to secure an appeal must provide for a case to cease to be on the accelerated detained appeal route if that is the only way of securing justice. And that roughly mirrors the process under the detained fast track. And of course, the primary aim of those representing people on the detained fast track was to get the appeal off the fast track so as to allow proper time to prepare a case. So that's all going to happen, one assumes, again, uh, under the accelerated detained appeal. Uh, I just note here, there is a challenge on foot to the new women's detention centre in County Durham, at Derwent side being brought by Women for Jeff, Refugee Women. That's to be heard in June, it's got permission. And that's brought on the basis, uh, inter alia, that the detention of women in a remote location without access to an in-person meeting with a lawyer is a breach of their right of access to justice. So we, we can see in that case, the interplay of, and combination of legislative and administrative arrangements. Not only will a woman be subject to an accelerated appeal, they can, on present arrangements, access a lawyer only by telephone and only get off the accelerated procedure when this comes in if they can show it's necessary for justice but they'll need a prima facie case in order to get off the accelerated procedure and one can foresee that for women who are late disclosing a rape or gender-based violence or experience of trafficking despite all the evidence showing those matters can be difficult to disclose and often aren't disclosed in a timely way the very fact of late disclosure will be held against them under the new provisions. There are notionally other protections against the detention of vulnerable trafficking victims, rape survivors, torture victims uh, under rules 34 and 35 of the detention centre rules, but there's been 16 years of litigation since the first case now called HK Turkey against such state for the Home Department. There's been probably more than 30 High Court judgments exposing the failures of that system, as well as numerous reports by Stephen Shaw, parliamentary inquiries, ombudsman, and so on, demonstrating those procedures don't operate in practice. It was a heavy feature of the latest inquiry, the Brookhouse inquiry into abuse in detention. So those provisions are unlikely to provide any practical uh, protection against the injustices that look liable to flow from these latest um, reignition of the fast track procedures. Um, sections 28 and 29 and schedule 4 of the Act make provision for removal to safe third countries to pursue asylum appeals. These are, you will have heard about the so-called offshoring provisions that enable removal, it would seem, to Rwanda. 
Uh, they operate by a series of amendments to existing architecture of sections 77, 82 and 94 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002. Uh, whereas section 77 used to prohibit removal while an application or appeal was underway, it now allows removal to a safe third country. Um, as most of you will know, some of the arrangements under these provisions have been the subject of putative challenge by Care for Calais and Detention Action already. Uh, the initial challenges appear to have been about the lack of transparency as to what the arrangements with Rwanda actually are. As those become clearer, it can be foreseen that these proposals will raise issues under almost all of the substantive rights in the Human Rights Act. They'll raise issues as to extraterritoriality, as to compatibility with the Refugee Convention as implemented through the directives and domestic law, as to compatibility with Equality Act and common law protections against discrimination, with other fundamental rights protected by the common law. So for my part, I would see the impeding of access to justice as one of the principal points of objection. Uh, in Australia, the offshore arrangements there have been the subject of a lot of litigation and of course, international condemnation, including on, um, the litigation has included actions around the prohibitions on cruel and degrading treatment, successful actions there. Which, are, which is of course equivalent to our Article 3 in common law protections. So the Home Office here is flying very close to the wind of legality. That's part of its cultural tendency. And this is perhaps one of the more extreme examples. And it will inevitably involve a lot of litigation to sort all this out. My final comment, I want to comment here on the end of the process, the process for removals. Uh, I was involved in a case called FB, and medical justice against sector of state all about zero notice removals. The act to some extent reintroduces the idea of zero notice, i.e. just removing people without prior warning. Uh, and that's through section 46 of the act, which introduces new provisions amending section 10 of the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999. It introduces a system whereby notice of liability to removal with time to challenge that notification is required in all cases, but in a significant ranges of cases, um, departure details do not need to be notified until a person is being put on the aeroplane. So the provisions require the notice of liability to removal to be notified uh, five days before ordinarily, but the notice of departure details by which the precise date and destination are specified, those may be notified at any point and can be altered at any point. In other words, the duty to notify the person being removed is limited, is limited to communicating um, the date of departure and destination at the point at which they're removed. Uh, that legislation may well come into conflict with the common law notification principles established in the case of uh, Anu Frijeva. A decision doesn't have, that says a decision doesn't have legal effects until it's been notified. And there's a, an outstanding appeal uh, on questions of the old uh, removals windows system, which this act has superseded um, before the Supreme Court waiting decision on permission. So that's a very speedy and even so uh, over my time uh, look at part two. I'll hand back to Richard. Thanks very much. Right, well, I, I would just like to say thank you very much to, uh, to uh, Alex. Um, I think it foreshadowed a speech or talk confirms my own fear that we will be locked into a very long period of very complicated litigation. Um, but I now hand over to Natasha Jackson, who will talk about the criminalization provision. Natasha. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, so in this section, I'm going to focus on the criminalization provisions, which can be found in part three of the new act. Sections 40 to 42 of the Act introduce some significant and tougher criminal offences and penalties, which are largely brought in through amending sections 24 to 25C of the Immigration Act 1971. Just as Alex said in his video, the changes under the new Act are important and wide ranging and give us a lot of ground to cover. So in this talk, I'm going to aim to give an overview of the key changes, um, but a lot more can and no doubt will be said about them as we start to make sense of their implications. Uh, so first, to give an overview of the key new criminalisation provisions before talking about them in more detail, we have section 40, which makes it a criminal offence to arrive in the UK without valid, valid entry clearance or an electronic travel authorisation. 
and not just to enter the UK through attempting to pass through immigration control without leave. It also increases the maximum penalty for those returning to the UK in breach of a deportation order from six months to five years, and increases the maximum penalty for entering without clearance or overstaying a grant of leave from six months to four years. We also have section 41, which amends the facilitation offences of providing assistance to immigrants and asylum seekers, and raises the maximum penalty for these offences from 14 years to life imprisonment, and interestingly removes the requirement that facilitation is for gain when helping an asylum seeker to enter the UK. The policy statement that accompanied the bill suggests that these sections are broadly aimed to introduce tougher criminal offences for those attempting to enter the UK illegally, with the expectation that tougher penalties would deter some people from undertaking these dangerous journeys altogether. Before, to, before looking at the criminalisation provisions in the Act, it is helpful to first take a look at the position under Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention, to which the UK is of course a signatory. Charles Bishop will be talking to you next about the interpretation of the Refugee Convention, so I won't deal with this at any length, but it is useful to have in mind when considering the criminalisation provisions. As Alex set out in his video, Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention prohibits states from imposing penalties for unlawful presence on refugees coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom was threatened and who enter or are present in the state's territory without authorization, provided they prevent, present themselves without delay to the authorities and show good cause for their illegal entry or presence. For over 20 years now, the UK has, had limited, uh, has limited the available defences to criminal prosecution based on Article 31.1. Defences have only been available for a narrow range of immigration offences related to deception or the use of false documents, which are principally set out at Section 31 of the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999. As the High Court made clear in Papushi, in a case where the claimant sought to rely on Article 31 of the Refugee Convention as a defence to charges of forgery and using a false instrument, where he didn't have a defence that uh, where he didn't come within the statutory defences under Section 31 of the 1999 Act, the court said, um, and it's there on the slide, there is no room to apply the scope of Article 31 as interpreted and declared by this court in Adimi. We are bound to apply the narrower provisions of Section 31 even if in doing so it has the consequence that the UK is in breach of international obligations under a human rights treaty, which is obviously quite significant. Until now, the narrowness of the defence provisions has not had much practical consequence because it must be in the public interest for the CPS to prosecute, and this has rarely been the case. But the introduction of new offences for arrival without entry clearance or an ETA and the increased criminal penalties for illegal entry and presence, which I'll outline in a moment, are at least in part intended to encourage prosecutions. And we can see this from the explanatory notes to the bill at paragraph 398, which state that the longer sentence length will ensure that the police, prosecutors and the courts consider the offence as serious enough to take through the criminal justice system, indicating that we can expect a rise in such prosecutions. Before I go on to talk about the criminalisation provision specifically, I just want to draw your attention to section 37 of the new Act, which concerns immunity from penalties under Article 31.1, and interestingly removes penalties arising from offences of forgery, forgery or fraud if they are committed in an attempt to leave the UK, which feels like a bit of a culture shift, but um, may, may not make much practical difference uh, to prosecutions. As I said earlier, the focus of section 40 of the new Act is primarily on making it a criminal offence to arrive in the UK and not just to enter. The offence of knowingly entering the UK without leave is set out in section 2411 of the Immigration Act 1971. And importantly, entry is defined in section 111 of the 1971 Act as meaning disembarking and subsequently leaving the immigration control area. This means that those who arrive at an approved port of entry have not entered the United Kingdom until they have passed through immigration control. So if they claim asylum before attempting to pass through immigration control, they will not have entered the UK unlawfully and therefore could not previously, could not previously at least, have been prosecuted for this offence. And you can see on the slides there the references to Kakai and Kapoor, which set out this position. Um, the same was true if someone is rescued at sea and brought to the UK, and you have the reference there to the Manny case on the side in that regard. 
The explanatory notes to the bill at paragraph 392 explain that the change to include arriving in the UK is intended to control borders, as well as to address the smuggling and trafficking of persons. You can see the quote there, entering the UK without leave is no longer considered entirely apt, given the changes in the way people have sought to come to the UK through irregular routes. So in particular, this is, this is envisaging um, changes to the provisions to incorporate those who have crossed through sea, co sea crossings. Section 40 does this by creating two new offences. Through subsections 1 and 2, the Act inserts new subsections into section 24 of the 1971 Act, which concerns illegal entry and similar offences, to criminalise those who arrive in the UK without valid entry clearance or a valid ETA. Subsection 4 amends section 25 of the 1971 Act, which concerns facilitation offences for facilitating the commission of a breach of immigration law. Immigration law was previously defined as a law which controls non-UK nationals entitlement to enter, transit across, or be in the state. So the new act adds arrive to this list, meaning that those who have helped a migrant arrive at an immigration control area in order to claim asylum can now be liable for the criminal offence of facilitation. As I said earlier, the provision also increases the maximum penalty for entering in breach of a deportation order and for overstaying. These are likely to give rise to a number of points of interest, and of course many more are likely to arise as we see how the new Act plays out. But to pick out a few of the key implications, firstly and importantly, criminalising arriving to the UK and not just entering the UK is highly significant, as there's no available visa route to come to the UK in order to seek asylum. As the Divisional Court noted in Adimi, which was an important case concerning Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention, <clears throat> The combined effect of visa requirements and carrier's liability has made it well nigh impossible for refugees to travel to countries of refuge without false documents. Given that 90% of those who were granted asylum in the UK as of September 2021 came from countries whose nationals need entry clearance to come to the UK, this provision will necessarily either criminalise or deter the vast majority of refugees. Secondly, there is a clear question as to whether the provisions penalising those seeking asylum are consistent with the UK's obligation under Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention. Um, and for those who are interested, the UNHCR's submission on the bill, which was materially the same as the Act in this regard, were that it is not. Connectedly, with respect to the 12 months or four year penalties for unlawful arrival, entry or presence, which are introduced by Section 42F1 of the new Act, Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention requires that any penalty must be proportionate. The query also arises as to whether this is so. I think the effect of section 44, which widened, uh, section 40, subsection 4, uh, not section 44 to be clear, um, which widens the facilitation offences, is most helpfully considered alongside sections 41.3 and, 4, and 41.4. Section 41 mostly operates by amending the facilitation offences in sections 25 and 25A of the 1971 Act. Section 25, as we have seen, made it an offence to facilitate the commission of a breach of immigration law by a non-UK national. Section 25A specifically concerns helping an asylum seeker to enter the UK. The explanatory notes to the bill make clear that facilitation offences are intended to capture criminal smuggling gangs, setting out that facilitation may include behaviour linked to recruiting, transporting, transferring, harbouring, receiving or exchanging control over another person. However, the new section 41.3 notably omits, and this is despite pushback from the House of Lords, the requirement that a person knowingly and for gain facilitates, the, uh, facilitates a non-UK national coming to the UK from section 25A of the 1971 Act. The explanatory memorandum explains that the reason for removing the requirement to prove gain is that gains from facilitation may be cash in hand, taken while abroad, or otherwise difficult to link back to facilitation, making this difficult to evidence in some prosecutions. So the rationale lies in pinning down smugglers in line with the main objective behind these criminalisation provisions. But this exclusion does give rise to a possible implication that this amendment will move the target away from smuggling gangs and allow the prosecution of asylum seekers and refugees who assist each other to come to the UK, who can now face a maximum sentence of life imprisonment for doing so. 
Interestingly, the Supreme Court of Canada considered a comparable situation in a case called B010, I think that's how they say it, um, and held that penalising refugees in these circumstances not only violated Article 31.1 of the Refugee Convention, but is also inconsistent with the protocol against the smuggling of migrants by land, sea and air, which specifically required that Articles 5 and 19 that migrants who are themselves the object of people smuggling activities cannot be liable to criminal prosecution for smuggling offences under the protocol on that basis. The UK is a signatory to the anti-smuggling protocol, so a question again arises as to whether our international obligations are being complied with through the introduction of these provisions. Another point to consider, which is likely to be uh, particularly of interest to those who work on trafficking issues, is the potential implications with respect to Schedule 4 of the Modern Slavery Act 2015, which expressly prevents those charged under Section 25 of the 1971 Immigration Act from relying on the defence of compulsion because of their status as victims of slavery or trafficking. I think we're lucky enough to have Miranda Butler focusing on trafficking, is trafficking issues in the second instalment of this webinar next week. So if this is a field of interest to you, then please do join us for that. The last point I'll note about Section 41 is that it provides new exceptions and defences to facilitation offences to exclude Coast Guard coordinated rescues and to protect rescuers under certain conditions. A defence is also added in relation to stowaways. Now, I won't dwell on these provisions um, in this talk, as uh, I understand our audience is um, going to be made up of pr primarily immigration and public lawyers, uh, and so um, perhaps less interested in these particular defences, but they are there to be aware of and if you wanted to take a look. Um, and also for the sake of completion, Section 42 of the new Act introduces a new penalty for failure to secure a goods vehicle. Um, but again, I won't take up time on that provision now for the same reason. So in summary, the new Act introduces new criminal offences, expands the application of existing offences, and toughens the penalties that can attach to, uh, attach to these crimes. The provisions of the Act give rise to questions of interpretation and application with regards to our international obligations and in terms of how they play out in the domestic immigration context. So thank you very much for joining me with this talk, uh, for this talk. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Charles Bishop, who is going to be speaking to you about the interpretation of the Refugee Convention in the new Act. Well, thank you very much, um, Natasha. Uh, my talk is going to focus on the provisions of the Act that end at the end of part two, that introduce into primary legislation how the Refugee Convention should be uh, interpreted. So section 30 is the starting place for this. It introduces this group of provisions and it rather conveniently offers a summary of what they uh, do. Um, the sort of background to this is Brexit is really the essential impetus behind these changes. Most of the provisions were previously contained in the refugee or person in need of international protection qualification regulations 2006, which were the implementing instrument of the qualification directive in EU law. Um, that directive, as will be well known, deals with both refugee status and also uh, what is called subsidiary protection, but which is implemented in the UK through the humanitarian protection route. Uh, section 30, subsection 4 of the 2022 Act revokes the regulations as part of the ongoing process of establishing domestic frameworks to replace EU provisions which had previously operated as retained EU law under the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. Uh, interestingly, the qualification directive itself is not explicitly disapplied either here or from what I have been able to see elsewhere. Um, in the Supreme Court case last year, uh, uh, read G a child, uh, beginning of, it was around the beginning of last year, um, it was assumed in that case by both parties that the qualification directive remained retained EU law. Um, but notably, that did not appear to consider uh, Schedule 1, Paragraph 6 of the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Act 2020, um, which disapplies certain immigration related EU rights uh, in, in certain contexts. Um, so the Supreme Court sort of accepts what the party say in that case that the qualification directive remains retained EU law. Um, that did not appear to consider the 2020 Act. And what's, what's 
but perhaps that doesn't really matter because the, this this act, the 2022 act, uh, has taken an interpretation of, of, of the 2020 act, which suggests the qualification directive uh, does still apply because it has specifically disapplied in schedule in section 68 of the 2022 act the trafficking directive and if the trafficking directive was retained to you law before this 2022 act then it follows the qualification directive probably was also uh, so in essence it's all very complicated and it's unclear what it would actually really mean in practice uh, I would be interested to hear any views on this as I'm not clear what the government's position actually is on, on whether or not the qualification directive remains retained to you law. Um, it seems to be part of the government's intention is to retain harmony with the directive, uh, but in other ways also to depart from it. Um, but the government positions in, in the case G certainly was that the qualification directive at that point remains retained to you law. And just while we're on the slide, I'll just draw your attention to subsection one of section 30, which uh, makes clear that these uh, interpretation provisions apply only for the purposes of the determination of whether or not someone is an asylum seeker. Um, they only relate to the Refugee Convention. They don't relate to humanitarian protection, which was the case in the uh, refugee uh, qualification regulations. Um, and also just to note that they apply not just to decision makers in, in the Home Office, but also to courts and tribunals. So starting place, definition of refugee, very well known, Article 1A2 of the Refugee Convention, key points being that a person is a refugee if they uh, owe, are owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership, of a particular social group or, or political opinion, the outside country of nationality and are unable or, or owing to such fear, unwilling to avail themselves of the protection of that country. Um, we'll just pause at that point. Um, the Act establishes for the purposes of domestic law how those concepts should be approached and carries forward uh, most of the provisions that were in the regulations. Um, so there have been some minor amendments to the language of the of the qualification regulations in, in this carrying over um, process. Um, uh, it's bringing into the status of primary legislation something that was previously the status of secondary legislation, but which carried the weight under it of EU law because of its implementation of the directive. But in the process of that carrying over, there have been some minor amendments to reflect the fact that this applies only to the determination of an asylum claim and not to humanitarian protection claims. But um, I'm going to focus on what are the key changes, because there have been some changes that are certainly more than minor. Um, and the first key change, which I'm going to spend quite a bit more time on in a moment, relates to the requirement for a refugee to have a well-founded fear of persecution. And the Act essentially introduces a balance of probabilities assessment to determine whether the applicant has a, in broad terms, convention characteristic, i.e. are they who they say they are, um, and whether they also actually fear persecution. It then uh, introduces another stage which reverts to the lower standard of, of the well-known expression reasonable degree of likelihood in relation to whether or not the individual faces an actual risk of persecution. But I'll come on to that in a bit more detail, just want to go through the other key changes. Uh, secondly, there's some tightening and, and, and restricting, really, of the definition of, of what is a particular social group. Um, essentially, what needs to be shown now is both that the group in question has some innate or fundamental or mutable characteristic. There is a particular statutory language that we will look at. Um, and secondly, and secondly, I, you need both that there is some particular perception of being different in the society. So it's, it's bringing together two ideas that previously were sort of two gateways to a particular social group, and now these are both required. Um, and the third key change, which, which I'm not going to cover today because this is not much time, but it essentially now introduces a presumption that an asylum seeker can avail themselves of protection where the specific requirements in Section 34.2 are met. Those requirements are unchanged, but what has changed is that uh, there is a presumption that protection is available. So just pausing there to talk about when, when are these changes going to take place. Uh, well, they only apply to a determination relating to a claim for asylum where that was made on or after 28th of June 2022. 
Uh, so I think that would affect appeals and indeed uh, claims for judicial review, where this may be part of the determination, uh, which arise from claims made before 28th of June. Uh, I think there's a question over when an asylum claim is deemed to be made for the purposes of this provision. This is now governed by section 14 of the 2022 Act, uh, but that is not yet in force uh, and will be commenced by regulations. Section 14 essentially incorporates paragraph 327 of the immigration rules into primary legislation uh, with some tweaking. That provision itself uh, was introduced at the, when we left the EU because we had left the Procedures Directive. Um, as before, the requirement is that a claim uh, is only made when it is made in person. That's the beginning of section 14, subsection 1. One reading of this provision is that then a claim is not actually made, and a claim for asylum is not actually made until the asylum seeker has formally had their, their screening interview. Um, and, and that might suggest that merely phoning the intake unit is not enough. Um, I'd be interested in other views on this. I think it's quite important because as I understand it, uh, basically uh, speaking to people on the ground, they um, are at the moment quite significant delays in obtaining screening appointments right now. Indeed, I've heard of waits of up to 20 weeks. Um, and I think that would introduce quite a significant element of unfairness. So those individuals who have tried to get appointments before the changes to the law are made are denied the greater protections that the current law offers and, and then are forced into the position of the, of the changes. However, it may be possible to read um, section 14 the other way. Um, uh, and uh, there's arguments, I think, on both sides of this. Um, and I think there's probably also a question whether actually section 14 is the governing provision of this or whether it actually should be determined at the moment by paragraph 327. I think the upshot of all of this is that if you're advising anyone uh, who's going to be claiming asylum, they should claim as soon as possible. So, and I want to um, go into the standard of proof in a little bit more detail. Uh, it's important to understand the background to this because the effect of the act is essentially to reverse around 20 to 30 years of case law. Uh, the established position in UK law prior to the act is that an applicant has a well-founded fear of persecution if there is a reasonable degree of likelihood that they would be persecuted for, for one of the convention reasons if returned. That was set down as long ago as the uh, Sivir Kumar in case um, in, in the 80s in the House of Lords. Um, that standard has you know, sometimes been expressed as a, a real or fanciful, uh, as opposed to a fanciful risk. Um, some of the cases that say that in, indeed that language also features in the Sivir Kumar case itself. Um, I would just note Lord Walker's um, rather pithy statement in the H.J. Iran case in 2010, where he said, where life or liberty may be threatened, the balance of probabilities is not an appropriate test. And I just want to just flag that because we're going to look at the balance of probabilities in a moment. Um, there had been a suggestion previously, uh, both, well, both before Siva Kamaran and then afterwards, that there could be some kind of different test applied to the assessment of past events or um, uh, in, in the determination of an asylum claim. In the Kaja or, or Kaja case, the um, AIT rejected an attempt to introduce a two-stage test of determination of past and present facts on the balance of probabilities and assessment of real risk in relation to future possibilities. So looking, you know, in, in, in many claims, the past events would be looking at, you know, is, is what happened to the asylum seeker uh, true, it, what is what they say true as to what happened, and then applying a lower standard when looking at what's the risk or to them when they go back. Um, but in, in, in Kaja, they said that the test of reasonable degree of likelihood should be applied to all aspects of the determination as a unitary um, approach. And, and that, um, while there was the, were some later cases that uh, seemed to take a different approach and over to comments, essentially, the position has been confirmed since the Karana Karan case, uh, that a unitary test is applied to all aspects of the well-founded fear of persecution test. It's a reasonable degree of likelihood. There is no balance of probabilities assessment as part of this. So now we go to section 31, which changes this, section 31 of the 2022 Act. And the critical part here are subsections two and subsection four. So subsection two introduces the first stage of the determination, 
which is that on the balance of probabilities, the decision maker has to determine whether the asylum seeker has a characteristic which could cause them to fear persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or opinion, or has such a characteristic attributed to them. Uh, and B, whether the asylum seeker does in fact fear such persecution in their country of nationality uh, as a result of that characteristic. Um, so that's the first stage. So it's now assessing that question on the balance of probabilities. That question is essentially uh, in, inherently related to the cre credibility question. And Alex has already gone through how some of the um, provisions make changes to how credibility assessment is to be uh, undertaken. Um, subsection 4 retains what is the current position in relation to the determination of actual risk. So the, determined maker, the decision maker must determine whether there is a reasonable likelihood that if the asylum seeker were returned to their country of nationality, um, they, would be per they would be persecuted as a result of the characteristic and that they would not be protected. So, I mean, I think it goes without saying that this is a question of quite significant importance for, for all asylum seekers, but particularly for those where there's less likely to be a debate over the existence of persecution in the country, and more likely to be a bit debate about whether or not the asylum seeker in question is actually affected by that persecution. So, for example, are they actually gay uh, if they're claiming on the basis of sexual orientation? So as I discussed earlier, this is only about refugee status. It leaves untouched uh, the humanitarian protection uh, route. Um, I should flag that that route has, is also undergoing some reform, not by way of uh, primary legislation, but consequential amendments to the immigration rules. Um, this is a shift that went without much significant fanfare during the passage of the bill. Uh, essentially, the route is now being focused entirely on Article 2 and 3 of the ECHR. Um, and, and not on the, the wider subsidiary protection that was under the qualification directive. I'm, I'm not going to get into today um, the, the changes to humanitarian protection really, just wanted to flag them. But the standard in, in those cases under Articles 2 and 3 of the ECHR has for a long time been that there are substantial grounds for believing that expulsion uh, of the individual would result in the person being exposed to a real risk of torture or inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. You can go back to the Suring case in the 80s on that and it's been repeated in, in many cases subsequently. So it's possible that one effect of this change to the interpretation of the Refugee Convention is that you're going to find more claims uh, falling into the humanitarian protection route. Um, at the moment, the um, uh, applications for refugee status, sorry, for humanitarian protection uh, must first be determined on the basis of whether or not it's a claim for refugee status. So I think you're going to see more going into humanitarian protection. Um, and the recent changes to the immigration rules align humanitarian protection with the Group 2 refugees under the Act, which, which um, Alex Goodman went through in his presentation. So I think the important question about all of this is what, what, what's this change actually going to mean in practice? Um, what's quite interesting is that this disparity in wording between the Refugee Convention test and the uh, ECHR standard um, was actually examined sort of summarily in the Supreme Court in 2010. Um, and I've cited here the uh, view there taken, which was that they didn't consider there to be a practical difference between reasonable degree of likelihood and the uh, uh, the, the ECHR standard. Um, but what's notable is what Sir John Dyson said here, which is that it would add considerably to the burdens of hard-pressed immigration judges who are often called upon to decide claims based both on the Refugee Convention and the ECHR if they were required to apply slightly different standards of proof to the same facts when considering the two claims. Well, that is actually now the position that decision makers are going to be, and they are going to have to be applying two different standards at the same time. Um, and just, just flagging here what the Supreme Court said, that there was a question over whether or not um, the approach in, in Joan and Horvath, which was the approach that wasn't undertaken in, in the later cases, it, whether real possibility, um, well, the Supreme Court basically left open this question that is now a question that may actually have to arise as a result of, um, of, of this act. 
I mean, there's lots of semantics here. I think perhaps the most important thing is that there's going to be signaling to decision makers um, about there being some kind of change in the law. It opens up rather philosophical questions about how decisions are actually made. Do decision makers view their decisions on a sliding scale? You know, if you imagine an actual balance or scale of probabilities, is that really how decisions are actually undertaken? Or are they taken in a more binary way? So um, does, is the question really rather, uh, you know, do I believe this person or not? And, and, and I suppose there's a question, a sort of more sociological, not really a legal question, over what impact this is actually going to have on the ground. Um, I think it's going to be interesting if you have a situation where uh, someone says, I don't believe on the balance of probabilities that you have this particular characteristic that entitles you to uh, protection under the Refugee Convention. But I uh, think there are substantial grounds for believing there may be. Um, and so while I'm not going to grant you refugee status, I will, I will uh, grant you humanitarian protection. Um, it's a slightly odd situation that decision makers are now going to be in. And I think like Alex and Richard have have noted, it's probably going to be something that gets worked out in litigation. So clearly these provisions in departing from these long-standing principles were, were highly controversial. And I, I, I've included on this slide an excerpt, a summary, uh, summary of the problems that were highlighted by a very large group of um, NGOs and organizations during the passage of the bill. Um, uh, you know, it, it, those really speak for themselves. It, it does impose a higher hurdle for asylum claimants to overcome. Um, there's questions over how compliant this is with the Refugee Convention, uh, as that has as that has been determined subsequently and through the UNHCR's advice. Um, uh, I don't I don't want to dwell on these. I just want to flag um, the government's position um, during the passage of the bill. Um, Lord Wil Wolfson, who was the relevant minister at the time, although he's now resigned from government, wrote to Piers in a what's called a will write letter for those who are familiar with the eccentricities of Parliament. Um, and, and really what he was getting at was that this um, change is focused on providing clarity and consistency. Uh, and while he asserts here compliance with the convention, he was provoked for many times in Parliament to try and expand on this, but did not appear to do so. And so it's not entirely clear um to those who are interested in these questions what is exactly the government's case on how this is compliant with international obligations so uh, and just a little bit more detail came from tom persglov um, who in the comments uh, who's minister um and what's what's interesting is really you can see that here there's a focus on guidance being provided to decision makers. And I think really in conclusion on this topic that I think the guidance is likely to be of the most practical importance going forward. I think the decision makers guidance is more likely to be turned up rather than the legislation. But where we may see more of an impact on decisions is at the appellate level uh, by uh, first tribunal judges and at higher stages where the legislation is more likely to be the starting, the starting point. So I just want to spend a little bit more time talking about the particular social group changes. So I put on this slide here, section 33 of the 2022 Act, uh, which sets out what the definition of a particular social group is now. And the, the key change here is those words I've highlighted, which is that you need to meet both of the two conditions on that page. Um, at first blush, the rest of this provision otherwise looks very similar to the qualification director of regulations. Now, those two limbs essentially originate from the qualification directive and its implementation in the domestic regulations. Um, you can see how the first, the first, um, the first limb is uh, what's often referred to uh, as the protected characteristics or a eustem generis approach. Uh, it essentially looks at something other than persecution to define the group. So it's looking at some innate characteristic, something about the group that cannot be changed, uh, that is inherent to their identity or so fundamental to their identity, it can't be, it can't be changed uh, or shouldn't be changed. The second condition defines the group more by reference to how it is treated in society. So it's perceived as being different by the surrounding society. And there's been a really long debate in academia and in the case law over which approach should be taken. The way it was sort of cut through is that actually both approaches are okay. However, um, 
uh, so if we just just go into that in a bit more detail i, I mean in in fauna which is a uh, house of lords case in the mid noughties um this was over so held to be the position that those two routes through the particular social group were both acceptable um and that was recently confirmed uh, as part of the ratio of the decision in dh uh, which was 2020 the tribunal decision the act now basically reverses that approach and says that actually you need both limbs it's not either limb it's both limbs um and so really the effect of this is a new hurdle for applicants to to overcome uh you have to be able to demonstrate both that the group in question has uh, uh some innate identity but also that in the particular country in which the claim uh, relates to that uh uh, there, it, is, it has a distinct identity within the social perception of that of that organisation, of the sorry, of that, of that country. So the government's response indicates that they were never really happy with the position that the case law was taking, um, as as Lord Walton sets out in the same letter that I referred to earlier. Um, he he says that they're actually not changing their policy or their position. They basically were saying this is what they always wanted it to be, and they didn't like the approach that the courts were taking. Um, I think it's notable that there isn't really a squaring up of what that actually might mean in practice. Um, and I would just flag that Lord Wolfson again in a later debate in the House of Lords seems to indicate that this isn't, wouldn't mean that women who are victims of gender-based violence are less likely to be accepted as a member of a particular social group as long as they meet the conditions in 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 the in the, in the particular provision but what he doesn't acknowledge here is that of course they need to meet both conditions whereas they never needed to meet both conditions before so that surely does mean that there is an increase in the hurdle otherwise what would be the point of this change um so i think that's another matter that's going to have to be left for further litigation uh, and uh, that concludes my presentation now. So I think we are moving on to questions. Well, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you very much indeed to all three speakers, although, sorry, I'd like to say thank you very much to all three speakers, although Alex isn't here uh, to hear those thanks. In the, in the conventional, pre-pandemic setting, we would now be asking uh, the audience to show their appreciation in the traditional way. As it is, you just have to listen to me. I hope you can hear me. I'm conscious that there have been uh, some issues, but if, the, if any other panelists can let me know if I can't be heard at the moment, I'm doing my best to speak fairly directly to the microphone. Um, the, the last of questions that have come through uh, I think the first of them is for Charles, or Charles may be able to say something about it, which is what the precise basis is at this moment in time for the Rwandan plans for removal to Rwanda. Um, plainly, the, the, stat the statute lays down some sort of basis for it. Is any further steps necessary? Are any further steps necessary under secondary legislation? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Rachel, I didn't quite hear all of that, but I think I think you're referring to the Rwanda plan question. Yes. We've been asked what, what's the exact legal basis of the Rwanda plans. Um, the nationality and border, the, the question says the Nationality and Borders Act puts into statute inadmissibility rules, which will determine who is eligible for removal. But does Rwanda have to first be designated a safe country in secretary legislation for them to be removed there, as required by the Asylum and Immigration Treatment of Claimants Act 2004? I think you know, this is a really quite complex issue. It's, it was, it's primarily governed by Alex's talk and he may have had more to say, unfortunately, as, as you know, he can't be here today. Um, it is also a plan that's subject to challenge and, and, and I'm not, I haven't seen the grounds of the challenge, but indeed this may be part of the challenge. Um, I would, however, just draw your attention to section 29 and schedule four of the Nationality and Borders Act 2022, uh, which Alex did highlight as being kind of impetus for the Rwanda plan and that that does make changes to the Asylum and Immigration Act 2004 and, and sets out in further detail how uh, the concept of safe country should be or say third country should be um, approached in, in UK law. Right. Thanks. I have another go at asking Natasha a question now. Can you can you hear me now Natasha? 
I can. Thanks, Richard. Good. Okay, well, I'll try. I'll keep on shouting at my computer. I'm tempted to do that anyway, but I'll, I'll do it for more purpose now. Uh, we have had a question through about whether if you arrive in the UK by air, you are likely or will automatically be um, a Category 1 uh, applicant for the purposes of claiming asylum. I don't know if you're able to comment on that. Thanks, Richard. Um, no, I think that's a good question. I think, um, I think we can say that Group 1 certainly can include arrivals by air, and in practice I expect it usually will. Um, but it isn't the case that someone will be in group one because they have arrived by air, because they'll still need to meet the other requirements for that group. So they will have to have come directly from a country or territory where their life um, or freedom was threatened. So, so that obviously leaves open the question of whether someone's got connecting flights or have traveled through another country. Um, also, they'll need to present themselves without delay and will have to show good cause if they've entered or presented unlawfully. So. Group one certainly can include people who've arrived by air. And as I say, I think normally will, um, but it's not, uh, arrival by air in itself doesn't equal uh, inclusion in group one necessarily. A, a sort of related question that's just come through. I don't know whether I, either you or Charles would want to answer. I mean, um, take, I, take a, sorry, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, have, you, have you got something to add to the question that we just had? Charles? No, no, no. <laughs> Right, okay, well, the, the next, next question which has come through, maybe comments from either of you, um, take an example of someone who arrives on a student visa, claims asylum at the first available opportunity, but where the motive for the trip, as I understand the question, was to claim protection, group one or group two, or do we need some further and more difficult clarification? Um. I think that's really going to come down to a question over what does without delay mean. Um, so the requirement is that they, the individuals come to the United Kingdom directly from a country or territory where their life or freedom was threatened and they have presented themselves without delay to the authorities. Um, I don't think there is a definition in the statute over what without delay means. Um, so I, I think that's, that's going to be probably one of the very first uh, points of litigation, I would thought, because there would be quite a lot of people in that position. I don't know, Natasha, whether you've had anything on that. No, no, I, I quite agree, Charles. I think a lot of that will turn on, on the question of delay. Um, and and um, I, I think that this is something that will be litigated because um, it's not entirely clear how these provisions are going to play out. Um, and you can probably anticipate that's going to be the answer to a lot of things there, uh, whether. <laughs> In, in the new act, but um, I, I think that's a really, really good question um, from Olivia and certainly we'll be interested to see what happens there. I guess there's a question over when does the delay begin? Is it delay from the period of when the grounds for the claim first arose, which may not necessarily be the same as when they arrived in the UK? Um, I mean, that, that, that would apply certainly to so fast claims, but also where if someone had some alternative basis of stay in the UK, they might feel they didn't have a need to claim asylum. So. Um, you can see how these various questions could be used in different different ways in, in the argument. I mean, it's essentially a question of statutory interpretation uh, and an argument on the facts. Related question: Are the are the groups? The, the, is the division between a group two refugee and a group one refugee absolute? Is there some any form of discretion to treat someone who might other, might be a group two? A uh, refugee as a group one, one if, for example, they've been trafficked, any possible blurring of the lines? Charles? Um. Question, the answer may be, we'll wait I, and I, see. I, yes, I, I can't immediately see there being a discretion, but I wouldn't want to say there isn't one. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that it, as, as I hope everyone appreciates, this is a very new piece of legislation that lawyers are going to have to be poring over, really thinking about these really interesting and quite tricky questions, um, that a lot of which will be subject to litigation. Right. Okay. Um, um, for, for Natasha, um, any comment on the impact of criminalisation of, of, caused by the mode of arrival in the UK on the ultimate claim for entitlement to asylum? What impact does the criminalisation of 
the means of arrival have on the actual asylum. I think, um, thank you, Richard. Uh, I think that's a really important question, actually, and um, maybe something I, I would have liked to have covered in the talk, um, because as we've seen under the criminalisation provisions, the penalty for arriving in the UK in breach of a deportation order has increased from six months to five years, um, and even more importantly, the uh, penalty for entering without clearance, or without entry clearance or an ETA, has also risen, this time from six months to four years. And those thresholds can have um, an important impact on a person's ability to claim asylum. Um, as, as we know, the Secretary of State will only grant refugee status if she's satisfied that, among other things, the person doesn't constitute a danger to the community of the UK. And someone would be presumed to do that if they have committed um, a particularly serious crime. And um, that's drawn from the provisions against uh, reform that are in the article, uh, that are in the Refugee Convention, rather. I think it's Article 33.2. Um, but these are defined under English law at Section 72 of the 2002 Act, which provide that a particularly serious crime is one for which a person is sentenced to at least two years of imprisonment. So the increased penalties, which now take a crime from six months up to four years, can potentially have the double effect of both imprisoning the person claiming asylum, but also being a basis for refusing their refugee claim. Um, and actually, just, just while I'm on that, I'll, I'll note that, that there have been changes to the immigration rules that um, accompany the Act, and I think it's paragraphs 30, uh, 334 and 339D of the immigration rules, um, which both concern the grant of asylum and humanitarian protection, um, have now actually been amended to make specific reference to Section 72 of the 2002 Act. Um, at first glance, it doesn't look to me like these changes affect the substance of the rules, but um, just something else to be aware of um, in, in the immigration rules themselves. So yeah, that's a really important question, I think, um, a potential implication of, of the increased criminalisation provisions for, for those seeking asylum. Just, um, Natasha, while you're on that, on the changes to the immigration rules, we've had a question, what is the initial maximum period of grant envisaged by the Act for Group 2 refugees, and will they be entitled to family reunion? And I think I'm right in saying that that question is now answered by these accompanying changes to the immigration rules. Um, so uh, I can put a link to that in the, I think I can send a link to everyone. Um, uh, we, we, haven't we haven't covered those immigration rules in detail today, but I think that's where the answer can be found. That's a really good point. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, the immigration rule changes, there's potentially another document that we can circulate um, after this talk, if, if that's helpful. Um, Thanks, Richard. Sorry about that. I've got even past the note about uh, about a dog. <laughs> um, nothing to do with it. I think one one final question, uh, which is really for Charles, but it might illuminate, it might give a chance to provide some further illumination on the practical impact of the changes to the standard standard of proof. Uh, standard of proof. Um, are there particular groups that are likely to be impacted uh, by the changes to the standard of proof? Uh, you outlined I think, the talk. I think the issue that, for particular people. Yes, I think I think really on the standard of proof, you're where it will probably find most impact is where credibility is of paramount importance. So it's probably cases where the persecution in the country of origin is really well documented and, and really not in dispute. Um, so there are a number of cases where that would be the case um, for, for gay people, um, but also um, certain other countries. Uh, so uh, or, or perhaps religion claims so Christian converts to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Iranian converts to Christianity, for example, um, where the, um, higher standard of proof where there's already, I think there's already quite well documented concern about the standard of proof that is already being applied by decision makers and that um, there is some research which indicates it's not actually the, the correct standard of reasonable degree of likelihood, that moving to balance of probabilities as, as to that assessment over whether or not someone has the characteristic that they say they have um, is going to be quite important. One thing I should flag, actually, which I didn't go into in my, my talk, is that although this change in the law is, is, is similar to the debate that was happening in the case law 20, 30 years ago over whether or not you apply balance of probabilities assessment to past facts, 
actually this this approach is slightly wider in, in the case in, in the statute because it's not applying a balance of probabilities assessment to past facts it's applying a balance of probabilities assessment to whether or not someone has a convention characteristic which wouldn't necessarily include past facts it could also include other uh, other factors so it, it's a little bit more nuanced um i mean it applies to past and present facts i suppose um I mean, it'd be interesting, Richard, to have your view on this as well, as you were in uh, the MA Somalia case, you acted for the appellant in that case, which I want to draw attention to, which sort of actually is where some of these debates sort of are posited theoretically as not, but not really being much importance, but actually now have taken on a renewed importance given the changes that have been introduced. Yeah, I perfectly, I mean, I, I was indeed in, in MA Somalia, um, but one of the features of my involvement was that there was no detail, actually, about the difference of uh, uh, potential difference of standards of approach. I mean, you know, I, I, I find it very difficult at either the Court of Appeal level or the Supreme Court level to actually believe it mattered very much. You needed to get into the facts, and you won or lost on the facts. You won in the Court of Appeal on the facts and lost in the Supreme Court. Credibility, which I mean, for the reasons that you gave, I mean, the example of somebody who fails the standard on a refugee convention basis, but uh, is held to be entitled to humanitarian protection because of the application of a different standard, shows how difficult it is to really envisage cases which turn on the balance of uh, on the burden of proof. It's treated as very important in either case law, it's treated as very important in academia. I am less convinced that it uh, justifies very detailed concentration in, in fact, we asked to speak louder, so it's sort of a, a problem. I don't, I hope some of that came through. I'm not inclined to say it all again. <laughs> I think what, the, the thrust of what you were saying, I think, Richard, was that it's an interesting question in the academia and in the case law, and certainly case law at perhaps um, a higher level than really most asylum claims ever reach, so a court of appeal and Supreme Court level. But your sort of instinct is that you're not sure it's going to have a huge practical implication uh, for uh, many decisions because, um, you know, really it's, it's all down to the facts. And... Uh, the facts are either in your favour or they're not, and, and and so whichever standard is applied to that, if if, if the wind is going a certain way, the you know the, the, the semantic phrasing of what standard is being applied, what legal test is being applied, is not to be of significant importance. I think that's essentially what you were saying. Yes, it is. I mean, I mean in, to, to my mind, this this change kind of echoes the sort of changes that are being debated about changes to the Human Rights Act. One thinks in particular about the change to the positive change in the consultation documentation to section two, um, which would produce a rather diff a slightly different test uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the application of section two of the Human Rights Act. Um, but it's very difficult to know in advance what, what is actually going to change in practice. And a likely effect is going to be. I think in the human rights sector context, a lot of litigation to demonstrate that we've ended up in pretty well the same place. Now the burden of proof position may be the same under this, under the, uh, under the present act. Obviously a lot of the other provisions are crucially important and, uh, and will make a massive practical difference. But I'm not convinced about this one. I don't know whether that was audible either. Good. I, I'm going to uh, call for the day. We thank you very much indeed for all the, the questions and, uh, and answers that have come through. I think we've answered the questions that uh, produce kind of rather wider considerations of the, of the Act. We will obviously have a look uh, when this webinar is over and see whether it's worth putting anything more in writing on any of the unanswered questions. Can I once again thank all the all of all our three speakers and all the uh, participants who provided us with the questions to answer? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, thank, thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thank Bye. everyone for attending indeed.